Good evening, I'm Paul Hunter, and this is The National. You can't have everything, boy, oh boy. On the heels of a stinging defeat, Donald Trump rocks the Capitol with a new chief of staff. Where does this leave an embattled administration? Another shakeup in BC. Former Premier Christy Clark quits as Liberal leader and MLA. The impact on the province and beyond. A search begins for artifacts from Canada's lost shot at aviation glory. They're fired off in the lake and they haven't been seen or, or touched since. Plus, monster art invades Ottawa. Well, it can be hard to gauge the drama in Washington these days, but today hits high on the meter. The U.S. president has replaced his chief of staff. So Reince Priebus is out. His 189-day tenure, the shortest in modern history. It comes after Donald Trump was denied what would have been his first major legislative victory, a loss that came at the hands of his own Republicans. Katie Simpson takes us through it all. After a week of infighting and policy failures, Donald Trump is losing yet another high-profile staffer. Announcing late today, Reince Priebus is out as Chief of Staff and Director of Homeland Security, General John Kelly, is in. Reince is a good man. John Kelly will do a fantastic job. General Kelly has been a star. Priebus was still traveling with the president this afternoon, even though he offered his resignation on Thursday. I think the president wanted to go to a different direction. The, the president has a right to change directions. The president has a right to hit a reset button. His decision comes after Priebus was publicly shamed by White House Communications Director Anthony Scaramucci. Reince wants to explain that he's not a leaker. Let him do that. Scaramucci went on CNN insinuating Priebus was leaking information and described him using unflattering expletives in a conversation later published by The New Yorker. General Kelly leaves Homeland Security well-respected and received praise from Trump at today's speech to law enforcement. John Kelly, who has done an incredible job of Secretary of Homeland Security, incredible. One of our real stars, truly one of our stars. But Kelly is now walking into a White House where morale is low, divisions are deep, and few accomplishments have been achieved. They should have approved health care last night, but you can't have everything, boy, oh boy. Trump is recovering from a stunning loss on a key election promise, health care reform. Republicans in the Senate failed to get enough support for their latest plan to repeal and replace Obamacare. Senator John McCain was one of three Republicans unwilling to prop up the bill, and in dramatic fashion, the war hero who returned to Washington following his brain cancer diagnosis stunned his colleagues as he approached the speaker to deliver the thumbs down no. This is a disappointment, a disappointment indeed. So let's turn the page and work together to improve our health care system. Democrats say they are open to improving Obamacare, but some Republicans appear ready to give up. I regret that our efforts were simply not enough. Senior Republicans like Mitch McConnell are facing intense scrutiny. After spending seven years criticizing Obamacare, the party was unable to get rid of the program, even though it has a majority in the House, the Senate, and a Republican president. If Mitch McConnell cannot get the job done on this, how is he going to get the job done on the rest of President Trump's agenda over the next three and a half years? Six months into the Trump administration, and not much of that agenda has moved forward. Paul. Katie, John Kelly has military experience, but not a lot of political experience. Why does Trump think he can do the job that Priebus evidently could not? Well, he's well respected in the military, at the Department of Homeland Security, and is well liked at the White House, so it will be a breath of fresh air. Kelly has also taken a hard line on information leaking, in the past comparing it to treason. Donald Trump has been embarrassed by all of the West Wing leaks, so this could be a step toward plugging the holes. Paul. Thanks, Katie. Katie Simpson in Washington tonight. A little more about the president's new chief of staff. John Kelly is 67 years old, born and raised in Boston. He's a retired four-star Marine Corps general with plenty of international experience, including a tour in Iraq. 
In the past, Kelly has criticized the Obama administration's military policies, such as trying to close Guantanamo Bay and opening all combat roles to women. As for Senator John McCain, even though he toughed it out for those crucial votes in Washington, the 80-year-old is now going back home to Arizona for medical treatment. McCain's office said today on Monday he will begin a standard post-surgical regimen of targeted radiation and chemotherapy. During that time, Senator McCain will maintain a work schedule. Now, while all that was going on in Washington, Moscow was retaliating against Washington and its new round of sanctions. As the CBC's Thomas Degler tells us, some believe Russia's angry reaction is a bit of a show. While the flag outside can stay, some who work inside will need to go. Moscow is kicking out hundreds of American embassy staff, enough to match the number of Russian diplomats in the U.S. That's 455. What's more, the government's seizing U.S. property in Russia, a compound meant for storage, and an outdoor retreat used for barbecues. Moscow's message came in the form of this video, warning Russia reserves the right to resort to other measures too. The deputy foreign minister put it this way. We do not exclude any moves to bring extreme Russophobes on Capitol Hill back to their senses. The bill is passed. A retort aimed at U.S. senators, who yesterday approved new Russian sanctions for meddling in last year's election. Nice to be with you. The sanctions now need the approval of a U.S. president who's shown respect for his Russian counterpart and cast doubt on Moscow's meddling. He may sign the sanctions exactly the way they are, or he may veto the sanctions and negotiate an even tougher deal. Vladimir Putin is in the business of trying to create chaos. Bill everywhere. Browder, once the biggest foreign investor in Russia, now a Putin critic abroad, testifying yesterday in front of a U.S. Senate committee. Today in London... They had to do something for their domestic audience, but this is the minimum possible that they could do. Browder told us why he feels Moscow isn't hitting back harder over sanctions. And they're still holding out all the hopes that, that Donald Trump will be uh, repealing sanctions or doing whatever he can to make life better for them. And so they don't want to box him into a corner where he doesn't look like a winner. It's no surprise the proposed U.S. sanctions are proving unpopular in Russia, but they're also being criticized here in Western Europe, with the EU worried about energy security. It's a sign of the far-reaching implications of a feud between two giants. Thomas Dagg, CBC News, London. North Korea is pushing the envelope again, launching its second long-range intercontinental ballistic missile today. It's believed to have flown higher and further than the first, which suggests the regime is inching closer to its goal of being able to hit North America. American surveillance picked up the launch before noon Eastern time. The missile traveled about a thousand kilometers before splashing down inside Japan's territorial waters. The U.S. believes North Korea could have a nuclear-capable ICBM as early as next year, though some analysts believe they may have that capacity already. Coming up, after months in jail, Turkish journalists get to defend themselves, but even that can lead to more charges. This sample here was really, really dirty. Plus, volunteers put safety first at a music festival. It's not just the drugs they're checking. Former BC Premier Christy Clark is quitting politics just 10 days after NDP rival John Horgan was sworn into her old job. She announced her resignation earlier today, effective next Friday. 16 years of liberal rule came crashing down last month when Clark lost a confidence vote. It was one of the longest running dynasties in a province with a history of volatile politics. Today, Clark called her own six plus years in the Premier's office an incredible honor and privilege. So what does this mean for British Columbia and the rest of Canada? Richard Zussman joins me from Vancouver for more on that. Richard, why now and what does this do to the Liberals? Paul, this is seemingly the election that never ends. It all is from the fallout from the May 9th election. And then we saw that confidence vote in June and Premier John Horgan recently being sworn in. And now Clark has decided she's not going to continue on in politics. And a lot of this has to do with the fact that the B.C. Liberals 
had a caucus meeting in Penticton today, and she decided to let her caucus know before many of them went on summer break that she wasn't continuing on in politics. But the legislature is slated to return in September. She wanted to make sure that they were ready for that, and Rich Coleman will be the interim leader. He is a former longtime minister for the Liberals. And then part of this is all about, you know, what happens now in the legislature when they do return. Together, the Greens and the NDP have 44 seats. And now with Clark resigning her seat, the Liberals have 42. So we were expecting, Paul, that every vote was going to be a tie after the Green and NDP put forward a speaker. But that's not going to be the case anymore. And the other key question, of course, is what does this mean for those big energy projects? It could mean a lot because it looks like at this point, Paul, that we're going to have John Horgan as premier at least until the fall of 2018 or potentially the spring of 2019. It gives him a little bit more wiggle room to do what the provincial government here in B.C. can do to slow down the twinning of the Trans Mountain Pipeline. They're currently looking at all their options, which include withholding permits. The Trans Mountain is looking for to start construction as early as in September. Thank you, Richard. Appreciate it. Thanks, Paul. Edmonton police say they've pulled off Canada's largest fentanyl seizure. Edmonton's Drug and Gang Enforcement Unit seized 130,000 fentanyl pills with the help of the RCMP. It has a street value of about $3.9 million. Also found were large quantities of cocaine, car fentanyl and meth from a home that had been turned into a processing lab. Authorities say they'd been working on the takedown since March. Canada's largest airport is warning passengers about possible delays after more than 700 ground crew workers walked off the job. Members of Teamsters Local 419 at Toronto's Pearson International Airport are on strike after rejecting a contract offer from their employer, Swissport. The company's baggage handlers, cargo handlers and cabin cleaners service 30 airlines, including several busy low-cost carriers like Sunwing and Air Transat. The union is demanding better hours and benefits. Air Canada and WestJet are not affected. Cigarette companies lost billions of dollars in value today after a powerful U.S. agency unveiled a plan, the biggest government push against smoking in more than 50 years. As Vicodopia tells us, it's all about nicotine, and it may not work. Despite years of progress in getting smokers to butt out, 15% of American adults still light up, about the same as in Canada, and those rates have been relatively flat for the past few years. So the new head of the U.S. Food and Drug Administration has a strategy to change that. Uh, render cigarettes minimally addictive or non-addictive by regulating their nicotine levels. Unless we change course, 5.6 million children alive today will die prematurely later in life from tobacco use. Cutting the nicotine in cigarettes is not a new idea. Light and herbal cigarettes have been around for years. What's changed is the arrival of a new tool to help smokers who want a nicotine fix. The FDA is gambling that weaker smokes will drive people to e-cigarettes, which are considered less harmful than tobacco. Even with unanswered questions about the benefits and risks, there are now different technologies to deliver nicotine for those who need it that doesn't bring with it the deadly consequence of burning tobacco and inhaling the resulting smoke. Research suggests the lower nicotine strategy has promise. And as part of its plans for a new tobacco control strategy, Health Canada is also considering the same move by reducing the addictiveness of tobacco products in order to prevent people from becoming users. But critics suggest if the nicotine buzz from vaping is the same as smoking, more cigarette smokers would have switched by now because it's also cheaper and that cutting nicotine could make a perennial problem even worse. Because we have contraband overnight, millions of Canadians are addicted to nicotine. If they can't get nicotine from cigarettes, they'll have to get it from somewhere else, and they will get it from inexpensive contraband cigarettes. Health Canada's tobacco reduction strategy is set to expire next year. While the government might be attracted to new ideas, such as cutting nicotine, groups like the Canadian Cancer Society want to stick to old reliable methods, higher taxes, ad campaigns, and plain packaging. Vicodopia, CBC News, Toronto. A sad update to a story we've been following this week in the UK. Little Charlie Gard has passed away. 
The baby boy captured the world's attention through his parents' failed legal battle to take him to the U.S. for treatment. The 11-month-old died from mitochondrial disease in hospice at an undisclosed location after his parents lost another legal fight to let Charlie die at home. Mother in Halifax is locked in a legal battle with the provincial government over money given to her terminally ill son. Nova Scotia Community Services said she failed to declare it as income and forced her to pay back more than $31,000. But now, as Angela McIver reports, the mother is fighting back. Samantha Monahan has spent years perfecting the right food mixture for her son, Luke. The six-year-old has a rare brain disorder called polymicrogyria, as well as fumarase deficiency, which affects his digestion and growth. He requires a strict diet. And it's pretty expensive. But he's growing and he's healthy and he's not nearly having as many seizures as he used to be. Luke needs a feeding tube and other special equipment, but Monaghan has been notified the electricity in her home will soon be shut off. She's also had to declare bankruptcy and she faces eviction from her townhouse for unpaid rent. Last year, Monaghan was cut off social assistance and ordered to pay back more than $31,000. I must be looked down upon at that department to be able to judge me and sit there and say, no, you owe $31,000, we don't care if you're a good mother or not. She appealed and lost. The department cited Monaghan's undeclared cash banking activity along with a $15,000 insurance settlement as reasons. Monaghan says most of the extra money came from fundraising donations to help pay for her son's treatment and the settlement was for his injuries in a car accident. Her lawyer believes that money shouldn't be considered income. This is money that is uh, for the benefit of Luke so he can get treatment so he can function a little better. To punish that family and Luke uh, because of funds that were received again for his medical treatment uh, seems completely wrong and unfair and shameful in my view. Community Services declined an interview, but in an email statement said generally there are many different ways an overpayment can be determined. Monaghan is now taking the department to court. She hopes a judge will consider her son's needs and cancel the outstanding bill. Angela McIver, CBC News, Halifax. It was once hailed as a game changer for Canada's aerospace industry. And now, nearly 60 years after the Avro Aero project was scrapped, an expedition is underway to find the original models of the aircraft sitting somewhere at the bottom of Lake Ontario. Stephanie Skenderis has the story. After a year of preparation, the Thunderfish is ready. The unmanned battery-powered vessel created in Newfoundland is now scouring the bottom of Lake Ontario using the same sonar technology used to find the Franklin Expedition's missing ships. This time, the prize is nine missing models of the Avro Aero. I guess you could call them almost a holy grail of Avro artifacts. Richard Maine combed through historical documents to help narrow the search to 100 square kilometres off Point Peter, Ontario, where the models, each one-eighth the size of the Arrow, were strapped onto rockets and fired over the lake between 1954 and 1957. They are fired off the lake and they haven't been seen or, or touched since, so they're going to be an incredible find and I, I think it will help Canadians reconnect uh, with the Avro story. This is the Arrow. Canada's first supersonic all-weather plane. It's a tale many Canadians know well, a supersonic interceptor developed by the Canadian military, but scrapped in 1959 by Prime Minister Diefenbaker, putting 30,000 people out of work. I knew that a great industry that had been established would be weakened, but it was right to end it. The leader of the expedition says the missing models are a reminder of what could have been. But had that program endured, Canada may be, or might have been, one of the world's leading uh, aeronautics countries in the world, and, and maybe Canada would have been the first country to put the man on the moon. Because ultimately what happened with a lot of those Avro employees was they went down to work for Lockheed and, and Boeing and, and NASA. The team is confident the mission will be successful, and it's hoping at least two models will be found intact. The goal is to put them on display in museums in Ottawa and Trenton, Ontario. Stephanie Skanderas, CBC News, Toronto. Wouldn't that be something? Straight ahead. International pressure is growing as Turkey prosecutes journalists. Well, it's a long way from the end of 
It's a long way from the Elma combo indeed for this Dublin band. On its first visit to Toronto, U2 drew barely 50 people to the Macombo's neon palms on Spadina Avenue. But while the crowds have grown, the message of U2 remains the same. It's a band that preaches social change, and their latest song, Pride, carries that banner. It's about Dr. Martin Luther King, one of the world's many peacekeepers, shot down in the line of duty in the name of love. u 2 singer is Bono Vox, not your average 1980s Bob Dylan, but a 24-year-old who says he's only writing songs about the things he cares about. How dare a, a white Irish rock and roll band write a song about a black martyr in, in the Reverend Martin Luther King? Well, there is a logical reason for that, if you look through it. See, the struggle in our own country, in Northern Ireland, the struggle between Protestants and Catholics um, has made me sick for a long time. And um, I often wondered what it would have been like had we have had a man the caliber of Martin Luther King. It's a result of songs like Pride that U2 is getting noticed around the world. Bono Vox says it's because they play good music. But he also knows the people are listening to his lyrics. U2 fans use U2 music to help express their own political feelings. We have people from all walks of life, and for that hour and a half, they're united. They're united as, as, as one audience, and that's something that the politicians can't do, I don't think, and that's bring those, all those people together, and I'm proud of that. Bono says U2's message is getting through even when the band plays Europe or Japan, countries that don't speak English because even if the audience doesn't understand the words, it will understand the music. Kevin Tibbles, CBC News, Toronto. After nearly two weeks of clashes and calls for a day of rage, a relative calm hangs over Jerusalem's old city. Hundreds of Palestinians gathered outside the Al-Aqsa Temple Mount compound today, and immediately after Friday prayers, they left, peacefully. But as Derek Stoffel reports, tension and a high security presence remain. The holy city on edge after two weeks of tensions. Israeli security forces on high alert as Muslim worshippers gathered for Friday prayers. But after violent clashes at the Al-Aqsa Mosque yesterday, there were restrictions on where people could pray. For the second week in a row, the Israeli security forces are not allowing Muslim men under the age of 50 inside the Al-Aqsa compound to pray. So they're worshipping right on the streets. Protests have rocked Jerusalem for two weeks now, following the killing of two Israeli policemen who were shot dead by Arab Israeli gunmen. Israel brought in new security measures, including metal detectors, but the Israeli government backed down after Palestinians protested, removing all the new security equipment. Today, Palestinians celebrated what they say is a victory over Israel. We win this battle that we enter to the mosque without a threatened of camera, without uh, these uh, instruments. Were you worried? Yeah, that? I was scared, actually. Why? I mean, like, because like, I'm just a kid trying to go pray, and there's so many guys with weapons holding their guns out. And, like, yeah, it's just scary that way. After prayers, most people simply went home, although there were some clashes in parts of East Jerusalem and the occupied West Bank. We'll make security assessments to the Kalandia crossing and other areas across Jerusalem to prevent any incidents. But things are relatively quiet and calm, however, tense on the ground. While the situation in Jerusalem subsided somewhat today, Israel has deployed 3,500 police officers in the city and they'll remain on high alert in the coming days. Derek Stoffel, CBC News, Jerusalem. Pakistan's Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif has been forced to resign. 
Supporters of the country's opposition leader took to the streets to celebrate Sharif's ouster. Pakistan's Supreme Court unanimously disqualified the prime minister from office and ordered a criminal investigation into his family's offshore holdings following a scandal over undisclosed assets. A ban on protests went into effect today in Venezuela, but opposition supporters still took to the streets, violently clashing with police ahead of an election on Sunday. They say the vote for a new legislative assembly is President Nicolas Maduro's attempt to create a dictatorship in the wake of months of political and economic upheaval. At least 112 people have died in protests since March, including seven deaths during a general strike this week. Protesters clashed with police ahead of an election on Sunday. They say the vote for a new legislative assembly is the uh, president's attempt to create a dictatorship. The Turkish government's crackdown in the wake of last year's attempted coup has been harsh, with mass firings and jailings of anyone suspected of involvement. Members of the press are no exception. Seventeen journalists are now fighting for their freedom in a historic case. But as Neil Coxell reports, many Turks fear justice itself is on trial. And tonight, a big setback. Fatma Shuk holds nothing back. The guilty and the crooks are out, and my son is inside. This is not the first time, she screams. She's just learned her son, investigative journalist Ahmed Shuk, must stay in prison while his trial continues. Shuk has already been in prison for nearly nine months, waiting to testify along with many of his colleagues at Turkey's oldest newspaper. They're on trial for allegedly supporting terror through their journalism. Turkey's president has said repeatedly the more than 150 journalists in jail in Turkey are not, in his view, actually journalists. A large group of the people you know as journalists, he said, are people who are helping terror. Even before tonight's decision from the court, it was an emotional week for those fighting to free their colleagues. In there, everybody is very strong, very cheerful, very happily, but then I go home and I cry for hours because I feel my human dignity is being attacked. Ahmed Shuk has been imprisoned for his work before. Canadian journalists for free expression gave him the International Press Freedom Award in 2013. He delivered biting testimony this week to counter the latest charges against him. The judiciary themselves have become the grave diggers for justice, he said. He's now facing an additional charge for what he said in his own defense. Columnist Kadri Gürsel must also stay in prison. He gave what supporters called a master class in journalism during his testimony, telling the court speaking to controversial people is his job. Journalists are curious people, he said. They meet different people. This is called journalism, and journalism is not a crime. The newspaper's journalists are well known for writing articles questioning the very people the government now accuses them of support. And they'll be dealing with this case for months to come, at least. Their next hearing isn't until September, and if convicted, some of the Jumuriyat staff are facing as many as 43 years in prison. Neil Koksal, CBC News, Istanbul. Coming up, Ottawa gets some monster size bragging rights. We're so lucky. This is a first in North America, not in New York City, not in Toronto, not in Vancouver. These giant mechanical creatures are causing a sensation, so where the heck did they come from? But first, Iran is ripe for foreign business, but Canada barely notices. Let's check today's business numbers. The TSX fell 62 points. The loonie gained almost half a cent. In New York, the Dow added 33 points to hit another record high, and the price of oil was up 67 cents a barrel.
I mean, fortunately or unfortunately, a lot of what I'm doing is what really the Canadian Embassy should be doing here in, in Tehran. Iran has been a magnet for foreign business ever since economic sanctions were lifted last year. Some Western countries dove in to sign deals, but Canada lagged behind, accused by some of taking a wary lead from the U.S. Things got even muddier today after the U.S. slapped fresh sanctions on Iran in response to a rocket launch. Earlier this year, Nala Ayed got rare access to Iran's oil fields and spoke to movers and shakers in Tehran. They wonder when Canada will get down to business. Canada's fabled embassy in Tehran first went dark in 1980 post-revolution, after staff spirited six American diplomats out of the country using fake Canadian identities, and then followed them out. The second time, in 2012, staff again destroyed sensitive documents, quietly shuttered the same offices, and slipped out in groups to different destinations, this time over security concerns and disapproval of Iran's policies. A vital channel between the West and Tehran was severed, given up along with the keys. Now fast forward to the 2015 election when the Liberals promised to reopen the embassy in the name of engagement and dialogue. And last year as government, it dropped the warning against all travel here. And Canadians have been coming here, we've met them. But the relationship between the two countries isn't fully mended. And that comes with a price. Since the Canadians left, Iran has taken a road thick with possibilities. International negotiations leading to rare international agreement to ice Iran's nuclear program in exchange for lifting sanctions on key state-owned sectors like the oil industry. Russia, China, Europe and the U.S. were on board. So the good news is that there is a solid agreement in place and according to all the watchdogs, it's working. As a result, Iran for the West was suddenly open for business. Some are calling it a gold mine. Foreigners rushed in, tens of billions in contracts signed, with the likes of Airbus, even with Boeing in the US, the biggest with a Western company since 1979. This is a country full of opportunities. Canadian-Iranian Cyrus Razaghi moved here years ago, hoping to see something just like this. I think overall the direction is right. An example was Airbus. We took the first aircraft after you know, almost four decades. That's a good sign. To truly appreciate Iran's renewed potential, you have to travel southwest, towards the border with Iraq, the front line in their war in the 1980s. This is Iran's oil country, home to its biggest oil field and its grandest sales pitch. And also this is our the oil processing area. With escorts from the Ministry of Petroleum, we were invited to visit a processing facility built under sanctions with China's help. A model of cooperation Iran now wants to duplicate with Western companies. Uh, I think about uh, 500 or something like that personnel we have here, but it, it will be changed. Reza Gohaki is the health and safety supervisor and our guide for the day. We will be grateful to working with the Canadians as well. Unlike Canada's, Iran's oil business is thriving. Here alone, 80,000 barrels per day and rising. See the oil storage there, which have 40,000 barrels capacity. But after years of withering under quarantine, the industry needs foreign investment. It also needs new technology the kind Canada has in spades. 
we first met Canadian Ehsan Gayuminia at the airport in Ahvaz, the capital of Iran's oil-rich province. He used to work in Canada's, but when the nuclear deal seemed inevitable, he moved to the country of his birth. I figured, you know, all these uh, companies in Calgary are uh, suffering and they're having such a difficult time. So I thought it was a good opportunity to help both countries uh, kind of uh, shake hands and bring business, bring Canadian companies to Iran and also bring new technologies to Iran, so that way it would benefit both the countries. It is a gold mine, I'll say it again. He started talking to Canadian companies even before the sanctions were lifted, and then after, helped them navigate a market poorly understood in the West. I mean, fortunately or unfortunately, a lot of what I'm doing is what really the Canadian Embassy should be doing here in, in Tehran, uh, which is providing confidence in Canadians to enter the Iranian market answering their questions, their concerns. There are also concerns about the sturdiness of the nuclear deal. Hardline elements here and in the U.S. who would rather see that deal die. Donald Trump's tougher line on Iran adds to the uncertainty. For Canadians, this is especially disconcerting. Without an embassy, lives have been complicated, Canadians in trouble, harder to help. Ottawa can't have Iran's ear on human rights or anything else. And yet, beyond a meeting between the foreign ministers last fall, there's been little measurable progress. Not helped by the arrest of Canadian professor Homa Hudfar or Trump's unexpected win. We put the question to the foreign ministry. Spokesman Bahram Ghassami said Canada must first remove remaining sanctions. We are hoping that this issue of the remaining or the remaining issue will be solved as soon as possible and the necessary agreement will be made and we can at least in the next phase of the protection of the two countries in light of the nuclear deal, Ottawa did lift some sanctions last year to ease business. But Gayu Minya says it's not enough. It's major. I mean, I think the biggest issue is, is that Canada currently does not have uh, an embassy in Iran. Ottawa and Tehran still seem far apart. And yet, at a small office behind the Tehran Chamber of Commerce, there's just enough hope the Iran-Canada Chamber of Commerce is stirring back to life. Every week, every minute, every month, we expect the relation will be established. They want to bring back the 2,500 members they once had when Iran was one of Canada's biggest trading partners in the region. My visa was three years, multi, two years, multi. It was very easy. It was no problem. Now? Now very difficult. I have to go to Ankara. I have to go to Dubai. So that is not good. I'm not going. Canadians have the problem in the other direction. Yet Gayu Minya's idea seems to be working. He now has several serious Canadian clients. But the challenges have multiplied too. My number one priority is to dismantle the disastrous deal with Iran. President Trump is an unforgiving critic of the nuclear deal. He's called it the worst deal ever made, a cash infusion for the terrorist groups Iran finances. This deal is catastrophic for America, for Israel, and for the whole of the Middle East. When he was elected, the White House's posture on the deal it helped negotiate changed overnight. Iran points out all the world's major powers signed on, and they did, giving new life to the oil industry and putting aside long-time concerns about who owns what in Iran and whom exactly the lifting of sanctions benefits. Its atomic energy chief and vice president told CBC News if the U.S. violates the deal, then Iran could easily restart its nuclear program. We will deliver whatever we have been committed to, that for sure. 
and we expect the same thing from the other side. I think both countries have to take this opportunity seriously to not to destroy the trust which is being built up. Please come forward. We're going to start in about 10 minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gentlemen. The collapse of the deal would be dire and would multiply the region's tensions. But Tehran presses on with its ambitious sales pitch. Razaghi helped put on a well-attended automotive conference. But for foreign investment, the Trump effect has been an unmitigated chill. For companies who wanted to come to Iran until uh, the, you know, the presidential elections in the U.S. And then now it's the attitude of the foreign companies or and investors is like, wait and see. Next, Trump included Iranians on a list of banned migrants. Then nine days into his presidency, Iran tested a new ballistic missile. Trump put Iran on notice. Those with business ties to the U.S. hesitated, and some got cold feet, including two Canadian companies in talks with a private oil firm, one on the very day Trump was elected. They are afraid of they jeopardize their investment. They deny to continue our relations, so they somehow stop the relation with us, or at least they said for time being we prefer not to continue the, the situation as it is. The Trump effect seems to also be influencing Ottawa's decisions on Iran and its advice to Canadians seeking to do business here, according to sources familiar with the conversations. A spokesman for Global Affairs said Ottawa's commitment to re-engage hasn't changed, but that its approach to Iran has always been cautious and incremental. Canadian companies also need to approach the market cautiously with due diligence on ongoing Canadian and UN sanctions. And while Iran remains a country of serious concern, he said, Canada prefers dialogue over withdrawal, so it's willing to have discussions with Iranian officials. No doubt, Canada's decision to reach out to Iran was easier when world powers had a consensus. What to do now when insiders are warning Canada's biggest trading partner could clamp down in a way that might jeopardize the nuclear deal? Unfortunately, Canada, I feel like they've always been a follower. Uh, a follower to the decisions and the policies of the United States. Canada and Iran must still negotiate the terms of restoring ties. Canadians, meanwhile, might miss out politically and economically. One look at the traffic to and in Tehran, and it's clear Europe is well ahead in both. Uh, Canada can be a great partner. It's just some practical issues like not you know, having um, high-level diplomatic relations that need to be addressed before um, you know, practical business can happen on the ground. For Canada, regaining some influence here could be the payoff for engaging Iran, but not at any cost. So, promises aside, don't expect it to happen quickly. Nala Ayed, CBC News, Tehran. Up next, uh, music festivals mean summer love and illegal drugs. Now both are under scrutiny. Céline Dion, she's a big star in France and in her home province of Quebec. She isn't known at all in English Canada, but the young singer could change all that soon. Critics in France and Quebec have called her extraordinary, exceptional, a new international star. What amazes them is her voice and her age. Céline Dion is 15. My dream is uh, um, to 
to be international star. Off stage, Céline Dion is not unlike most 15-year-old Quebecers. Here she struggles with her very first English interview. In, in, uh, in to be able in, uh, to sing all my life. The Dion family, it's musical and it's big. Céline is the youngest of 14 children. She sung practically since she could talk. At 12, she became professional. At 14, she won the World Song Contest in Japan. At 15, she's won a gold record in France, the first Canadian ever to do it. Now she's at the top of the European song charts. And in Montreal, in the streets or here at a baseball game, she's a celebrity. So in Quebec and Europe, she's a star, but on Young Street in Toronto, she'd hardly get a second glance. That's expected to change. Tom Kennedy, CBC News, Montreal. J'attendais ce moment depuis très longtemps. I've waited a long time for this, says Celine Dion, the reigning pop diva at a rare hometown performance in Montreal. But Montreal is not home for Dion anymore. She's nowhere long enough to unpack her bags. Every moment is given over to the business of selling Celine Dion. Ironically, the stage is her only sanctuary. I love being on stage. It's because every day, everybody's telling me what to do and talk about this and don't mention this yet and don't forget to talk about that and forget, don't forget this and, you know, don't do this, don't do that. And, but on stage, nobody has the guts to come on stage and tell me what to do. Music festivals in Canada are facing a number of issues, ranging from sexual assaults to drug deaths. The Evolve Music Festival in New Brunswick is no exception. But this year, a group of volunteers tackled those problems themselves. Stephanie Van Kampen reports. Around 4,000 people make the trip to the Evolve Music Festival each summer. The standard greeting... Despite the carefree vibe, veteran evolvers know their four-day fest can be dangerous. The festival doesn't offer drug testing, so festival goers decided to do it themselves. A group of 25 volunteers set up a tent and advertised free drug testing, looking for things like fentanyl. In this case, that's MDMA. Oh, yes, it is. MDMA, also known as ecstasy or Molly. Josh Watts Good. says there's lots of that this flying around, along with LSD and nice cocaine, reaction. but also yes. other yes. stuff. I had a couple of samples of bath salts last night, and then this sample here was really, really dirty. This man has come to get his cocaine tested. Yeah, there's no speed in it. That's awesome. Armed with that knowledge, he's ready to take it. As the day wears on, volunteers of a different sort are needed. This tent, known as the Tea Hive, is manned all day and night. They offer psychological support for people overwhelmed, confused, or dehydrated, along with a cup of tea. As night falls, people move to the dance floor. There are patrolling eyes here, too. A group calling themselves the Consent Kitties keep watch for non-consensual sexual activity. The kiddies take shifts, talking to people about consent and alerting security when needed. A big thing for us being on the dance floor is just being a presence, having people see us and know that we're, you know, looking out for consent just so it's in people's heads. There were no reported assaults this year, and volunteers say because of their efforts, fewer people were sent to hospital. Just three overdoses and one person with heat stroke. Far less than previous years. Evidence, volunteers say their efforts are working, and needed. Stephanie Van Campen, CBC News, Toronto.
All right, up next, the story you've been waiting for. Mammoth monstrous creatures roaming the nation's capital. The amazing Alouette has outperformed anything that's been shot into space since the Russians started it with Sputnik 1. The mere fact that it's still faithfully sending back messages from the top side of the ionosphere is enough to make it remarkable. When it was launched in September of 1962, its designers figured that with luck it would operate for a year. As of right now, it's been in orbit for five years and seven months, and three of the six original batteries are still working. It was a picture that Canadian engineers had waited six years to see, and for which Canadian taxpayers paid $100 million. A giant space robot with Canada's name on it and the Earth above. The remote manipulator system performing perfectly. Okay, and be advised that we're looking at a great picture. Good evening. It was a spectacular liftoff and a history-making day for Canada. The shuttle Challenger blasted off the pad at Cape Canaveral at dawn. On board, astronaut Marc Garneau, the very first Canadian in space. Uh, this trip into space uh, for me has turned out to be more than uh, ever I could have hoped for. It's a great honor for me to uh, represent Canada in space. Three, two, one, zero, zero. and liftoff, liftoff of the Space Shuttle Discovery and the first International Microgravity Laboratory. Good evening. There's a Canadian in the heavens tonight, Roberta Bonder, going around in circles and entirely happy about it. Canada's second astronaut in space. She's orbiting planet Earth about 300 kilometers straight up. She left from this space center this morning, 59 minutes later than scheduled, but after a lifetime of anticipation, those minutes probably won't mean very much in the long run. Incredible view. A crucial spacewalk took place in the skies above us early today, and Canadian astronaut Julie Payette was in charge. Payette coordinated the mission from onboard the Space Shuttle Discovery. History was made high in the sky today. For the very first time, a Canadian walked in space. Early this morning, astronaut Chris Hadfield began installing Canadarm2, and with it, launched a new era for the International Space Station. With, uh, with great humility and pleasure, I accept command of the International Space Station. Get back soon. The National. The National. Tonight. Gargantuan mechanical monsters roaming the streets of the nation's capital. It's a spectacle that's drawing huge crowds as part of the Canada 150 celebrations. Tom Perry reports. A sleeping giant awakens. His name is Longma, the dragon horse. 12 meters high, 5 meters wide, a 45-ton mechanical monster. It's the work of La Machine, a French theater company that's brought its towering showpiece to Ottawa for Canada's 150th birthday at a cost of more than $3 million. It is probably one of the biggest productions ever in Ottawa, and we're so lucky. This is a first in North America, not in New York City, not in Toronto, not in Vancouver, but right here in the nation's capital. Thousands of people crowded into downtown Ottawa today. Some lining up high and low to watch Longma go past. Others following along as a team of drivers carefully and skillfully piloted the lumbering beast through the city streets. This is part art, part spectacle, part monster movie come to life, and people here have never seen anything like it. 
spectacular. Amazing. Uh, Literally amazing. Once in a lifetime experience. That is true. It was worth it. Actually, she was a little bit scared, but she still wanted to be there. So she, when I would approach the dragon, she was like, back up, back up. But uh, then you would see she would be really staring. And then when the dragon left, she was like, dragon, dragon. <laughs> dragon, dragon. Longma is not the only strange creature to descend on the capital. La Machine also brought along Kumo, an enormous robotic spider which was lowered from the roof of Ottawa's Notre Dame Cathedral last night. A multi-legged monstrosity sure to strike fear in the heart of any arachnophobe. The two behemoths will square off and tromp their way through the capital all weekend. A one-of-a-kind show on a truly monstrous scale. Tom Perry, CBC News, Ottawa. <laughs> Pretty neat. That's the National for this Friday night. For news at any hour, you can always go to our website, cbcnews.ca. I'm Paul Hunter. Good night.